today's video, this video, we'll look at how real information can be uh, represented uh, in uh, our digital computing system, or how does the digital computing system represent real information. To do that, let's take a look. So here I'm speaking on the microphone right now, uh, and this is how most of the sensors are. They are mostly uh, real world is not a zero or a one or a true or a false. Uh, this microphone that I'm speaking on right now is connected to my computer. So what is the computer here? Well, as I speak, sound waves, uh, I'm cre creating sound waves uh, that propagate, that hit the membrane of the microphone that vibrates. That vibration basically results in a waveform that looks like this. Now this waveform is a, let's say, a plot of value, which is, uh, let's say, voltage on the y-axis and time in the x-axis. So as I speak uh, and as I change uh, the loudness or the frequency my, uh, of the voice, the sound gets recorded as separate voltage values. Now, if I replayed, the, if I recorded that and replayed that, I would hear back those sound values that were recorded. Now, when this thing is recorded, this gets recorded as an analog value because it has different possible values. In, in fact, it has infinite possible values between any voltage range. So even if I restricted my voltage range from 0 to 5, some particular point on this particular graph might be, let's call this point right here, let's call that 1 volt. The one directly to the right of that might be 1.01 volt, or it could be 1.02 volts, or 1.009 volts, and so forth. So there's infinite possibilities in real-world signals, and the and the problem here is how do we represent that in a digital computing system? So uh, just a quick recap: so most analog, most signals that we have are uh, analog, and uh, our goal is to represent these analog signals as digital signals to a computing system or a processing system that's mostly digital in nature. So uh, here's another example of uh, potentially a voice value that was recorded over some time. If I wanted to represent this with a binary number that we've uh, seen so far, let's say this one goes from 0 to 5 right here. So let's draw a line right in the middle and say anything below this is zero, anything above that is a one. So what have we done? So we basically drawn a threshold line and indicated that anything above that is a logic one and anything below that is a logic zero. And what does that signal look like in that case? Well, if I reproduce that, then this part of the waveform that was underneath that line is represented as a zero. This peak right here that was above that threshold line is represented as a 1. So if I look at the binary information that I just recorded, it is nowhere similar to the shape of that waveform. So I might be able to capture some information, but there is a lot of information being lost. So I I'm not going to sound very good. Okay. So in, in light of that, how do we represent this kind of information from physical world or analog world into a digital computing system. That's the goal for today. All right. So this waveform looks complicated. So let's go to a very simple looking waveform, which is a simple sine wave. So here's a here's an example of a sine wave. Uh, I have 300 samples of that sine wave. Goes from zero until one. So this is the voltage, right? And this, let's say, is the time or the sample. Okay, now here's a sine wave, and just like before, since the sine wave goes from 0 to 1, let's draw a line right in the middle at 0.5, so we'll call that line the threshold line, and anything above that or below that, so anything above that is a logic 1, anything below that is a logic uh, 0. So that's what we get. So, well, in this case, since it was a simple sine wave, the information loss is not that great. I mean, that square wave, if you really pretend, it has the shape of a sine wave, but you really have to pretend to do that. Okay. Now, can we do so? By the way, what is what does this one-bit representation really mean? Uh, well, it basically means that there is a on a digital computer there is a transistor uh, that's turned on or off. So that's that transistor right there. Uh, a transistor is nothing more than a switch. Okay, and a computing system is built out of billions of transistors these days, and every bit has a physical meaning. It is when a uh, a particular value is a one, that means that 
transistor is on. It, one means on and zero means off. Right? So the transistor actually has a meaning. So bits one and zero actually have physical meaning inside a computing system. So, well, if if bits are just transistors, what if we represented two transistors for every number? So two bit representation. What that means is we have two transistors and we'll say that both transistors are off, meaning zero, zero. Or it could be that this particular transistor is on, so I could have zero, one. Or it could be that the first transistor is on and the second one is off, so it could be one, zero. Or it could be one, one. So if I have a two bit transistor or two switches, so I have two switches like this, well, I'm basically enumerating all potential cases that these switches can have I, between on versus off. So, uh, same example with a two-bit representation. Here's a sine wave again. Now, with since I can represent it as two bits, let's call that bottom part zero zero, and there's a threshold line right here, right here between that. We'll call that zero one. Uh, let's call that one zero, and then we'll, the top part we'll call it one one. So we can now partition this particular sine wave into four different chunks. Each chunk is represented by two switches. So two bit representation meaning two switches are dedicated for that, or two transistors are dedicated for that, or two rows of memory are dedicated for that. So here we go. So if we do this, then our representation goes from a perfect square wave to a little funkier. And that funkier wave looks a lot closer to that sine wave than it did uh, a while back. So what if we did three bits? Now if we have three bits, we have three switches, and each of the switches could have values 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, all the way to 1, 1, 1. So with three switches, we can represent eight different levels. So here it is, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, oh, 0, Sorry, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and a 1, 1, 1. So those are the eight different levels. Now, if I partition the sine wave in those eight different levels, what I see or what I get is a lot more realistic looking sine wave. It's not perfect, but it's getting much, much closer to a sine wave than it did just a second ago with this square uh, square wave, right? So the higher the number of bits, the closer we get to representing a physical quantity that is actually measured. So, so far what we had looked at was just one bit, and now we find out that a collection of bits is actually necessary to represent our signals that are, that are being captured from real world sensors. So, one, so here's an example of eight bits being dedicated or eight switches being dedicated. Okay, so here's eight bits of data, one, zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one. This bit is called the most significant bit, and this one is called the least significant bit. And uh, since now we have more than one bit, we called eight bits, a collection of eight bits like this is called one byte, B-Y-T-E. Uh, a collection of 1024 bits is called a 1 kilobit. 1024 kilobits is collected and it's called 1 megabit. 1024 megabit gives rise to 1 gigabit and so forth. So uh, collection of bits is to represent uh, the number system. Okay. Now, well now, why does a computer use a binary number system anyway? Well Let's ask another question. Instead of asking why binary, let's ask ourselves, well, why do we use the decimal number system? Why do we use zero through nine? Well, most likely it's because it's easier to count in the hands. And if I count in my hands, I have exactly 10 fingers. Uh, so zero through nine becomes much more intuitive. Uh, similarly, on the computer side, uh, the transistor can be represented as either on or off so we can count in a on a, on a computer uh, using these transistor switches as either on or off so that's why we have a binary number system now next we're going to look at how do we count so well let's before we figure out how do we how do we, how does a computer count let's go and look at how do we count so typically when we count right so typically when we count we count from 0 through 9 we count 0 through 9 
what happens after we get to nine? We run out of our digits, so we start pairing digits, right? So how do we pair digits? So we basically say, okay, well, zero through nine, well, that's done. So let's grab this one, place it here, and call it one, and then we'll basically repeat zero through nine with a one written in front of it. Well, that's all done. And then we go to the next row of the first column and say, wait, well, let's grab that two, and let's start adding two there, and so forth and so on. And we eventually get all the way to 89, and then what happens? And we basically say, well, let's write down zero through nine again, but this time we're gonna grab this nine, so 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99. When we're done with that, we're done with every single every single digit on the first column. So we say, okay, let's grab one zero, bring it here, and write down one zero, and basically pair zero, one zero, put a one through it, and so forth until one zero, and we get a nine. And then we move on to the next column and and start writing. Oh, sorry, next row and start writing. 1, 1, and a 0, and all the way through 1, 1, 9, and so forth. That's exactly how we count. So in binary, the counting is actually even easier because we only have 0 and 1. Well, we only have 0 and 1, so well, it got lost in that mess right there. But let's say, in binary, we only have 0 and 1. Well, we're done. Well, just like before, now let's, let's start collecting or uh, grouping uh, more than one bits. So in that case now, what do we have? Well, we're done with 0 and 1, so let's just write down 0 and 1 and take this 1 right here and add a 1, 0 and a 1, 1. Well, we're done with the first column. Let's move on to the second column. So again, we write a 0 and a 1 and basically add a 1, 0 in front of this, a 1, 0 in front of that. Well, we're done with that row. Well, let's add a 0 and a 1 again and use this and we write 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. Well, we count it from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so far. So that's how we count in binary. So here's a quick count. So here's a count of 0 through 15 decimal and a corresponding count in binary. In the next video, we'll continue with this and go in a little bit depth between decimal, our number system, and the binary number system.